While the media in the United States focuses on a broken health care website and a small percentage of people who have their health insurance plans, there's a kind of blackout on the long-term consequences of the Fukushima power plant meltdown in Japan. Hi, I'm Ted Asfragadu. This is Truth Out Interviews. And on this segment, I have a couple of returning guests, Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zeese. He's the host of uh, Clearing the Fog on Radio.org on We Act Radio, 1480 AM Washington, D.C., and on Economic Democracy Media, which is on Ustream TV uh, slash It's Our Economy, and they co-direct It's Our Economy on the organizers as well of popularresistance.org. No wonder you guys are so busy. You guys are doing a lot of things here. Welcome back, Kevin and uh, Margaret. Thanks for having Thank us. you for having us, Ted. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the Fukushima meltdown. This is really kind of unprecedented, this kind of disaster. I mean, I was alive during the Three Mile Island accident and certainly during Chernobyl, but nothing like this has ever occurred that, that I have any recollection of, and I don't think anyone has at this point. No, it's never happened in the history of the world. And, no. and what happened back on March 11th of 2011 is that there was a 9.1 magnitude on the Richter scale earthquake off the coast of Japan, which caused a tsunami, a wave that was about 40 feet in height, and um, and that overwhelmed the Fukushima nuclear power plant, which was on the coast of Japan. There were four reactor buildings at, at sea level, and of the four of them, one actually had the fuel rods outside of the reactor, up in a storage pool, because it was being worked on, but the other three, over the course of the few days following that double disaster of the tsunami and earthquake, three of those, of those cores, reactor cores, melted down, melted into the basement of the reactor, and they think they've gone into the ground. They don't know how far they are. They don't even actually know where they are. And, um, and over the past two and a half years, as we're coming to learn over the last month, because uh, the power company that manages it has not been forthcoming, um, they're having huge problems with water contamination uh, flowing into the ocean. and and now these uh, fuel rods, these spent fuel rods on the property that have to be removed, 1,500 of them are stored in that, that fourth building at a height of 100 feet, 100 feet above the ground. Uh, that okay. building has been damaged. So how are they, how are they keeping uh, this core cool? Are they, putting, are they still throwing seawater on it? Not seawater. We hope not uh, seawater. They're, no, they're, they're throwing water on it. And, uh, and Margaret mentioned three disasters. Three meltdowns never happened before. Massive amounts of water flooding in the Pacific Ocean, 300 tons a week, never happened before. Fuel rods up, up high, bent, uh, you know, in a, in a building that's sagging and falling, never happened before. Three disasters, never happened before. None of them have easy solutions. And, uh, and so what they're doing is they're trying to keep the fuel rods uh, cool because they're hot. One's up on the fourth floor. They're putting water on that. They're trying to keep the, th the three cores that are missing hot. They're putting water in where they think they are. Steam still comes up, so they're still hot. Uh, and, and, so on, and, and as a result of that, there's a lot of water flooding in the Pacific. Uh, we're finding tuna off the U.S. coast. Uh, every tuna tested in one study uh, had higher levels of the radioactive materials than they're supposed to, uh, and, uh, and, and the, the massive amount of water is just going to start hitting, of, of radioactive water is going to start hitting the U.S. coast uh, early next spring, so that's where we are. Let's talk a little bit about, about uh, something that you bring up in the article, which is, uh, and I'm not sure if this is government sources or if this is, these are some scientists uh, uh, suggesting that this may happen, but this radioactive water, because the Pacific Ocean is so big, that the amount of radioactive toxicity is going to disperse, so it, it's not going to be as um, well. It's not going to be as poisonous as they, they they people think it's going to be. Well, I mean, we don't know how poisonous it is because actually um, there hasn't there haven't they haven't been doing testing off of the coast to really determine you know how much of the cesium is in the in the water. But this is a continuing problem um, where each day more radioactive water is going into the Pacific Ocean, and if there is, a, if one of those cores melts towards the ocean, that could release another massive amount. If, um, if when they remove those fuel rods, oh boy. If, if the rods get too close to each other or they get exposed to air, they can ignite. And if that happens, sometimes it creates a situation in which it's out of control. They can't stop the fire, and there's so many spent fuel rods on that property that it would be the kind of situation where you just have to abandon 
and let it play itself out. And there's tremendous, I mean, they're saying just in those 1,500 spent fuel, fuel rods in reactor four, they contain the same amount of radioactive cesium as 14,000 bombs that were dropped on, uh, 14 times, 14,000 times the amount that was in the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. 14,000 the amount of radiation of yeah. Hiroshima. Yeah, so that's, a, that's, that's, mean, that's the potential. It's that astounding. And I'll create a cloud that will circle the Earth. It'll hit the United States in about a week. It'll cross the United States about a week later, then go on to Europe and keep on circling around. And it'll affect the soil, air, and this will affect most of the globe. This is a very, I mean, serious problem. And uh, we don't see any really easy solutions to any of these three problems. Each one of them, unprecedented, with no easy solutions, each one with a potential massive impact on the planet Earth. This this is pretty scary stuff. I mean, we're recording this on Halloween, and, and it's, <laughs> it's frightening. It's not a Halloween prank. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not, it's not fiction. This is a reality that could happen. Right. What about the international community writ large? I mean, we have a possibility of an environmental disaster that could affect the planet pretty much immediately. I mean, within weeks, we could see uh, a rather poisonous cloud of, uh, of radioactive elements going through our, our, our environment that is going to wreak havoc on all life on this planet. What kind, why is it that we at this stage do not have the political will? Is there something that's preventing the international community to come in and try and figure out what to do to contain this? Or is, is it something about the Japanese sovereignty? I'm not sure what's stopping people from, from, so, from uh, you know, yeah. other countries getting involved in this. In I mean, we are up. starting to see um, uh, members, people from Japan, uh, former prime minister, um, the, the nuclear reg regulatory agency that they have, starting to admit that they actually need international help. International experts have been reaching out over the past years, but part of the problem was that uh, TEPCO wasn't admitting the problems that they were having and that they were over their head, and neither was the, the government. Um, so there is a panel of, of international scientists who have put forth a 15-point plan to deal with this. So there is, there is that, that wisdom out there and people that are willing to engage in this. Um, but it, it's, um, it, what we find is that at so many different levels, the nuclear industry has real influence. It influences the United Nations, the IAEA, the World Health Organization are all um, kind of corrupted by the nuclear industry. So that's a huge problem. Well, well, plus, you have, plus the Obama administration is very much supportive of nuclear. Uh, you know, he's been funded by the nuclear industry through his whole career. He's appointed energy secretaries that are very pro-nuclear. And this is not good advertising for nuclear. Uh, and so discussing it in the U.S. media is not something that they want to hear. In fact, CNN is going to be playing a, a nuclear uh, propaganda piece on November 7th. Um, I don't know why they start showing a movie, but unusual for CNN. They're going to be showing a movie on the 7th. That's a nuclear propaganda piece. Uh, and then the Japanese uh, current uh, uh, Prime Minister, Abe, is also very pro-nuclear. He'd like to see all nuclear plants open again, even though the people are protesting it. People, hundreds of thousands of people went out in the streets protesting nuclear in Japan. And so there's this kind of strange balance that the powers that be are in bed with the industry and they want to keep pushing nuclear. Uh, Obama just reached a trade agreement with the Vietnamese uh, two weeks ago uh, to share nuclear information with them. And uh, Kerry said it's great for our business interests. Our business interests? I mean, come on, we have bigger issues than that than the profits of an, a dying industry. Uh, and so that's what I think is the root of it. And so I think what really takes the people being organized, as always, on every problem, the organized uh, resistance of people uh, in protests and making demands, that's what will solve this problem. Uh, there's nothing that prevents uh, a global solution to this global challenge except for the nuclear industry and the interests they control in government. You know, on Truth Out, this, this article that you wrote called Fukushima, a global threat that requires a global response, has gotten a number of likes on, on Facebook, has been shared hundreds of times. I think we're up to, you said, like 10,000 likes at this point on, on Facebook? Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that is something where you've got a core of people who are taking this very seriously. They're not so distracted by the other stories that are in the media that seem to take precedence. But this is a real threat to our life uh, as, as, a media, as a planet, as a species, as, as all species on this world. The it's amount a media, of nuclear it's material a media that can threat. go up into the air 
uh, and, mm -hmm. and affect us is just staggering. And the fact that, um, as you said, the nuclear industry is acting like it's just business as usual. We're just going to go ahead and, and make deals and try to keep the world thinking that nuclear power is safe. But we have this, you know, well, the 500-pound the gorilla in the room is this melted uh, uh, nuclear power plant. This is ridiculous. With three interlocking unique problems with no easy solutions. And just this week, uh, the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Agency approved the beginning of the removal of the uh, of the, uh, the the fuel rods, the spent fuel rods, which is the riskiest thing that has to be done. They're going to start that on, they're saying November 7th, November 8th, somewhere in there, and that's when the disaster might really strike. Now, uh, some experts think you'll see a small disaster. They'll pull out a rod and nuclear, uh, it'll break and radiation will be released. They'll have to evacuate the plant and they'll just let it kind of calm down for a few days. We hope that's the minimum that happens because it could be much bigger than that. Maybe at that point, when they have their first little disaster, then they'll probably maybe welcome some international uh, expertise to come in. Uh, but we think it really makes more sense to start sooner than later and have those experts in now. I'd rather see them delay this, even though it's a risky delay, because this is an earthquake zone, a hurricane zone, a typhoon zone, and all of those could cause massive problems on their own. But we need to get this done right. right. This has to be done right, not rushed. And, and the TEPCO has not proven themselves to be very able. Yes, you did. You did highlight that uh, TEPCO is not very well viewed within Japan. In fact, uh, they used to be a very trusted energy agency, but not anymore. Well, they actually they continue to have to operate for profit, and so they've been doing that by cutting back. They've cut back the wages Incredible. of their workers. They've cut back on the a twenty percent cut in worker wages in two thousand eleven to save money. These guys are putting their lives online. They cut their salary twenty percent. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's the it's worker crazy. problem is, is huge there. And I mean, and already so many people in Japan have been uh, affected. So we, there are solutions, as I said, the 15-point plan put out there by international experts. Um, we have an international uh, solidarity letter that's calling for that plan to be implemented. It's calling for 24-hour access to accurate information for the media. It's calling for protection for the workers. And also, um, we're, we're calling for days of action starting on November 9th um, to bring awareness to this. And this letter is being signed. It's being circulated in Japan. It actually was, um, the draft was circulated before we went to the final so that the Japanese people could have input into this. Uh, we're finding there are groups of people all over the world that share these concerns. So it's really a matter of us um, coming together and making our voices heard. So we'll be at the United Nations next week on the 7th, delivering that letter to them. And there are petitions online you can sign at popularresistance.org. On the top banner, you can see one of the petitions there you can sign to take a position on nukefree.org. There are petitions as well. There are tens of thousands who have signed on to these petitions already, so we are starting to generate some momentum. People are worried about this. People who read about this are shocked by it. The shock that we're not told about in Armenia, we appreciate you covering it. That, that helps to get the word out further because people need to know this is a, a global problem that has a global risk. And uh, it's not an easy global solution, but the only solution is going to be if we bring the best minds together to really focus on this problem and solve it. Well said. Margaret, Kevin, I want to thank you for being on Truth Out Interviews. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Tim. Uh, take a look at their article if you haven't already. It's called Fukushima, A Global Threat That Requires a Global Response. I'm Ted Asfragadu. Thanks for joining me on Truth Out Interviews. We'll see you next time.